Hi everyone and welcome back to Coast Connections. It's our pleasure today to connect with the cosmos. We've got our friends here from the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Victoria and we're celebrating a very special centenary with them this year and Canada has a brand new National Historic Site. So let's walk through it with our two guests. Hello Dennis Crabtree. Hi. Liz. Welcome back. Thank you. Good it was to be a, here. It was a year ago almost to the date that we yes, had you last amazing. time. Yes. And you're the director of the uh, DAO. That's right. Very good. Director of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Yeah, say that three times. Yes. <laughs> and joining us today is Richard Pierce. Um, and this is a very interesting slice of Canadiana because Richard, you actually spent your childhood growing up at the observatory. Yes, I did. So we're going to share some of those memories and some of your fantastic photos with the viewers today. Oh, great. So thanks for uh, joining us today, gentlemen. And what a milestone this is for the observatory. 100 years ago, John Stanley Plaskett, and I believe we have a picture of John Stanley Plaskett and the, the two telescopes. but. Um, he invented this amazing telescope, 1.3 meter, 1.8 meter, 8 meter lens. Yes. And uh, he made it happen. He put Canada on the world stage for astronomy. He did. Uh, he lobbied the government in the 1910s or 1912, 1913 to mm -hmm. get Canada onto the world stage of modern astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And the government agreed. And in May 13th, 1914, there was a big public announcement of the building for a huge telescope for Victoria and construction started very soon after, mm -hmm. uh, and Telescope had first light. They took their first data on May 6, 1918. Wow, that's tremendous. And I think we have some photos here we want to show. Um, Carol Lee of uh, John Stanley Plaskett and the, the telescope itself. There we go, there he is. And he was a very renowned Canadian. Yes, very multi, multi-talented. He was a mechanical genius. Uh, politician lobbying to get the money. Mm -hmm. He was uh, designed some of the telescope parts. Uh, he did great science and uh, really is a remarkable character of, mm -hmm. of Canadian's history. And I understand a new book has been written about him. Yes, uh, there's a new book called Northern Star mm -hmm. uh, done by the University of Toronto Pre Press uh, is out and Peter Broughton is the author. 600 pages but it's a great read. Lots of wonderful photos, and uh, he really did a great job. Wonderful. Let's uh, show a photo of the telescope um, then, 100 years ago, and now. There we go. Is yes, the, yeah. you can tell the then picture because it's mm -hmm. black and white. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, so it, the telescope has been there since uh, 1918, and all the mechanical parts, everything is original. Amazing. Uh, the mirror is a new mirror that was replaced in 1961, mm -hmm. uh, a little better in reacting to changes in temperature. Mm -hmm. The spectrograph at the bottom of the telescope that takes the data, that's new. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the telescope is really uh, as it was mechanically. That's tremendous. And at the time, Dennis, um, that was the most powerful telescope on Earth. Yes, it was the largest operating telescope for yeah. about a year mm -hmm. uh, and remained one of the three largest in the world for over 30 years. Wow, that's quite an, an achievement. Yes, it for really Canada. is uh, mm -hmm. remarkable. Get a you know compliment to Canada's uh, dedication to science and mm -hmm. its you know, just ability to do something of that magnitude. Mm -hmm. And it was so impressive that uh, I think six or seven other countries actually yes, followed. Yes, uh, Plaskett did such a great job designing the telescope. Mm -hmm. He really paid attention to every detail. Uh, the telescope was so efficient and worked so well that the design was essentially copied by, I believe, six other telescopes in the world. Tremendous. And we have a few historical photos we're going to show, too, of the, um, the building of the dome there. Yes. Uh, Carol, if we can just cue those up. There we go. Yes, this is the uh, cement pier. This mm -hmm. is the, the solid foundation that the telescope sits on. And that was one of the first pieces that was, was built. Of course, before that, the whole site had to be leveled and cleared. And that was all manual labor. There was no big fancy machines like we have today to do it. So uh, it was a big job. Uh, yeah, but uh, horses the pier. and carts. And, yes, yeah, and dynamite. Old, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, basics. Right. Mm -hmm. And a few more photos we have to show as well. Uh, yes. So the, you know, after the uh, telescope is built, you also need a mirror. Mm -hmm. And so this is a picture of famous optician John Brashear. Uh, with the mirror in Pittsburgh. The mirror was cast in Belgium in 1914 and 
it was needed, uh, a second mirror was needed, and but Brashear wanted to get this mirror very quickly, so he said, send that mirror right away. Mm -hmm. And it turned out it left Belgium one week before the First World War started. The factory that was cast the mirror was destroyed. So if John wow. Brashear had not requested the mirror to be sent so quickly, there's a good chance the telescope would never have happened. Look at that twist of fate. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Yeah. That's tremendous. So the other thing about the mirror, when mm -hmm. it was finished, uh, they put it on a train and six days later it was in Victoria, from Pittsburgh to Victoria in six days. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 1918, right? That's... If that's, you gave it to Canada Post today, yeah. well, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it might take... <laughs> get it there virtually quicker, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And a couple more photos we have of the construction of the dome that we want to share with viewers too. Here we go. Yeah, here they are with the the, the base of the do the dome building more or less completed. They haven't mm -hmm. put the metal panels on the top part of the structure. You can see the telescope structure inside there. And what always amazes me in these old photos, there's always a person, a man standing there high up. I don't know what it's. It gives you scale too. Maybe that's yeah. what it's for, uh -huh. yeah. But yeah. 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 And then we have another one of when it's completed. Mm -hmm. And soon after they completed the telescope, they put a metal railing around it. So this is very soon after it was completed. Mm. The coat of arms there is George VI coat of arms. Um, the building looks like that today. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful structure. Yes. And now a National Historic Center. Yes. So that's fantastic. Mm. And Richard, you are a very <coughs> unique Canadian. <laughs> you actually spent, um, from age four to 15, is yes, it? Yes, 11 years. You were a childhood resident at the observatory. Now, that's a tremendous little slice of Canadiana. Well, it's the only life I knew as a child, so yeah. it, it may seem unique to others, but it was just my life. Yes, so we have a series of photos we're gonna show that you've um, dredged up from your uh, uh, treasure trunk to share yes. with us, and these are absolutely glorious photos. Good. Thank you, Richard, for sharing them with us and oh, yeah. telling us a bit of the story about how your family came to be on the hill. So how did a four-year-old boy come to be on the hill? Well, mm -hmm. my father got appointed as the director in mm -hmm. 1940. I was four years old. Mm -hmm. So I left uh, the city with my family and mm -hmm. we moved to the observatory. And I have a picture of the uh, family uh, in 1940. Yeah. Uh, that there we go. There shows my father and uh, my mother and my sister who at that time was about 20. She was away at the University of Washington, uh, always was away, and uh, myself at the age of uh, probably three and a half to four, just before we moved from a downtown area in, in Victoria, Wellington. And what was your father's role there at the observatory, Richard? Well, he came uh, as the result of being hired by Dr. Plaskett uh, in the early 20s mm -hmm. and was there as assistant director mm -hmm. and then in 1940 when Dr. Um, Harper, 1935, Dr. Harper took over after Dr. Plaskett retired, he was not well and Dr. Harper then passed away actually in 1940 mm -hmm. and my father then was asked to be the director and directors live in the residence which is called the White House and we have a picture of the White House mm -hmm. um, where I moved at yeah. the age of four. And this shows a picture of one of the 1940s with a car going up the drive. And that's a two kilometer hill? Uh, uh, it's a mile and a half up the road, so it would be a yeah. little over um, 2.4 uh, kilometers, mm -hmm. 732, 50 feet, somewhere about mm -hmm. 50 feet high, nine miles north of Victoria. So there is the dome, as you saw in a previous picture. And there's our house, the, the uh, director's residence there with these big redwoods out in front. Beautiful. And that's the home that I went to from uh, a street to 480 acres as a forest and the house, no one else on the hill except my father and mother and the instrument maker at, in the daytime. Wow. What a unique uh, childhood. Well, now, did you have full roam of the hill? <laughs> you know, oh, was, yes, yes, and that was wonderful because I got to know the flora and fauna of the hill and became aware. Um, and most of the adults were very kind. Um, the instrument maker's wife made me an Indian costume, and we used the term Indian in those days. Yes. Um, so there's a First Nations costume on this uh, six-year-old boy. And my father took me to the observatory when he was observing every night. 
So I wore my Indian costume around Halloween, and there I am looking at the, uh, through the telescope, which my father kindly taught me for those 11 years about the use of the telescope and how to look at it mm -hmm. and how it worked. And in the evenings, I often would have a camp cot that my father brought, and when he observed, I would sleep under the telescope nearby for the evening and in the morning dawn came my father would close up we'd close the cot up and we'd walk the hundred yards home to the to the hill and those were the evenings that i had with with my dad what beautiful memories how unique and that, that's where you learned about um, the stars and science and that really piqued your interest for a lifetime career yeah. in that field well yes i think uh, my father was very much uh, wanted me to have a good education. Mm -hmm. So I was given a set of books, uh, uh, one at a time, when I was there. And I still have 86 of the original 100 books that were in my child's library. Wow. Uh, Wind in the Willows, um, Pooh Corner, Vasco da Gama, all of those types of classics. Um, and from that, my love of books uh, was significantly influenced. Mm. So there I am on the couch reading one of my little Indian stories um, at a young age. There were no other children to play with, and uh, that made a rather singular life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, you went to school then where? Uh, well, I was your... homeschooled for six months. My mother was an elementary teacher in the older days, and so at the, I was born in February, so you weren't allowed to go to school unless you were six years old. Mm -hmm. So I was homeschooled for the first year, and then I went to Prospect Lake School down the hill, a little two-room school that had six grades in it, and as a result, um, had two years there. My mother became somewhat ill. She was um, 42 when I was born, so uh, she was probably close to 50, and um, I was then, it was suggested to go to a city school as a boarder, St. Michael's actually. And um, so I went there for a year. And then my mother passed away and uh, I came home. My sister came home, which was unusual. She was at a university. And um, so I had a year with her and my dad at Royal School, another little rural mm -hmm. school. Um, and life proceeded from there. Mm -hmm. Now you were on the Hill during the Second World War. Yes. Yes. And we've got some amazing pictures that you've sent us about uh, the firefighting that went on up there. Mm. And the what's this photo we're looking at right well, now? Well, <laughs> the little soldier. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is after I was in St. Michael School. There's the St. Michael School uniform underneath. But when I came home, um, was an army belt went on with a wooden gun and my father's air raid helmet. Um, we had fires on the observatory hill during the 40s. So many in one week that they stationed a battalion of, or a detachment of soldiers at, at the observatory. And of course, I went over to see their camp and got involved with, it, with them and they made me a gun and so on. And so I dug out some of my father's first World War implementations and put this on. So. <laughs> I was at school in the week with the uniform, but at home, I was at home with uh, what yeah. you saw. This is the result of the fires. Um, it shows my father in the background directing. There is a moss covering to most of the rocks on the hill, mm -hmm. and the fire um, smolders within the moss. So it looks like it's out, but it isn't. So it has to all be dug up and turned mm -hmm. over. So, yeah. Now, um, during the war, you mentioned that your mother was a plane spotter. Tell us about that. Well, the RCAF um, employed people to spot aircraft in the 1940s when the Second World War was on. There was a threat, as most of your viewers will have heard about or remember, uh, from uh, the Japanese. Yes. And so these women were called spotters. They had a pair of binoculars and they had a series of silhouettes of planes. And my mother would have a four hour shift out on the observatory and she'd record the planes that went by regardless of what they were and then report that. We had a special phone line into Patricia Bay. Mm -hmm. 
And so she had a red blazer on. The hummingbirds loved the red blazer. And um, she had a great time. So many women did, as you know, things for the war effort. And that was her effort. Wonderful. And I think we have a couple more shots of um, your childhood pictures to show here as well, Richard. What are we looking at here? Well, this is a result of some of the fires on the face of the hill. It shows the, uh, the forest being denuded on that. That's looking east uh, over toward Elk Lake. And, uh, and it's an aerial view. And was never threatened um, from fire? Uh, well, not directly, yeah. no. But <clears throat> during the war, the government said, we don't want the observatory bombed uh, if the, by course. chance. So there was an attempt to camouflage it. Yeah. So here's a nice shot of the dome with its trees and with burlap sacking and, oh, yeah. and uh, superstructure on there. Well, you could actually see it for miles, but, <laughs> but it did reduce the silver part of that. So that's a really nice shot. That's about wow. 1941. I was at school in this little country school and I'm in the first row on the right there with a sort of Navy pinafore on. I didn't fit in with the country school motif very well. School was a bit of a, 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 a difference for me because I wasn't socialized. Mm -hmm. And so it was a solitary type of life that I'd come from. But I still have now some friends from there. And there's the man that's responsible for all of this, my father. Mm -hmm. And he taught me many things. He was in the First World War as a, and a veteran, signaling corps, he was a major. So he taught me semaphore. He taught me Morse code and uh, a lot of uh, mathematics because that was his, his field. Mm -hmm. And we played uh, golf. There's a shot of the office building around which there was a putting course that was developed by my dad and one of the other astronomers. And there was a nine hole course and uh, everybody got out at lunchtime and played around the course. And we've got mm -hmm. several good pictures of people. And this is fascinating, Richard, because living on the hill, in the observatory. It was a meeting place for uh, the world's top scientists, astronomers. They would come through there. And you as a young boy got to meet all kinds of dignitaries from around the world. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. that well, was, that was a unique experience yeah. because the That's astronomers great. stayed uh, visiting astronomers, uh, European, Russian, whatever. They would stay at the house. We had a maid and uh, bedrooms. And so they were lodged there while they were uh, many times visiting my father. And um, um, Dennis's professional experience can certainly relate the number of astronomers that he's met worldwide as he's traveled and gone to various places. But I, as a small child, had people come to me. And I think, Elizabeth, one of the memories that I have is that I was curious as a young person. And when I was 12 and 13, I asked these astronomers questions mm -hmm. about the nature of the, the universe and God and so on and so forth. And it was some of these conversations that significantly influenced my curiosity. And you then grew up to become? Well, I went on to finish high school, mm -hmm. and then I went to university. And um, my first degree was in zoology and English, influences by my upbringing. Yes. And also astronomy, you said. Yes, well, yes. I went on and did a master's degree in the United States, and I took a major in astronomy. and. Uh, then a PhD in science education and taught in, in various universities. But I never lost my curiosity That's and um, my love of the sky. Mm -hmm. And uh, still today, I um, can go out and look under the, the sky and see the constellations and understand the, the, mm -hmm. the questions that were being asked at the time. What a wonderful foundation that your parents gave you uh, to pursue a life of um, science and exploring curiosity on deeper and deeper levels. It's really fascinating. Well, the legacy is, is very deep and after my mother died, my father remarried and mm -hmm. our stepmother was a bacteriologist and a, a very fine botanist and so I learned from her as yeah. well. So I've Front thought about that. to science in your whole life. Yes. Thank you, Richard, for sharing those beautiful photos. It's really, really an interesting well, it's piece. It's a pleasure to do that, yeah. Elizabeth. And Dennis, uh, speaking of you know global yes. and around the world and coming and going, Canada also has uh, some very powerful telescopes around the world today. Uh, the Plaskett one was our first one, but tell us a little bit about some of the others that we. Yes, right now manage. Canada, you know, has shares of telescopes in Hawaii and Chile. The two mm -hmm. in Hawaii are uh, 
the CFHT telescope, Canada France Hawaii telescope, that was built in 1979. That moved Canada from having only domestic telescopes to ones at better sites like Hawaii. Uh, Gemini also is another telescope that Canada has a share in on Mauna Kea and Hawaii. Um, Gemini has two telescopes, the other one is in Chile, and then Canada's also share in the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This is the world's most expensive telescope. It's uh, cost probably a billion dollars to make. A and billion. It's a billion dollars. Yeah. And uh, this is an array of radio telescopes at 5,000 meters in northern Chile. And uh, is doing amazing research, mm -hmm. discovering disks or round stars where planets are forming and all sorts of other neat mm -hmm. things. Wow. And astronomy and technology are so closely linked, aren't mm -hmm. they? I mean, they're, it's just hand in glove. The people ask, you know, why is astronomy important? Well, you know, it goes back to even Plaskett's day where, you know, there was, you know, then that was very high technology. A lot of the things that went into that telescope and the mechanisms and the way things were done were considered high technology mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, when uh, John Stanley Plaskett would give public talks in Victoria, he had these amazing things called lantern slides that people were just had never seen. Wow. And just he would, astronomy is bringing us new stuff to the to the public. Mm -hmm. And so today, you know, we're building instruments that again is very high technology. These instruments we build for telescopes that we are partner with. Uh, have are one of a kind instruments, and they incorporate the latest uh, latest technologies because astronomy is always working at the leading edge, trying to get the most mm -hmm. out of everything. And so we really push the technologies to their to their fullest. And what I also like about the astronomy community, if I may use that word, is the um, generous sharing of data, like globally. Like all the astronomers seem to be very willing to share their new knowledge, new breakthroughs. And one of the roles that you play there at the observatory is that data collection and storage. Yes, and um, you know, back in the early days, all the data was on photographic plates and mm -hmm. those were kind of, you know, hidden away and couldn't be used unless you were physically there. But once we started having digital detectors, like in your cameras now, mm -hmm. uh, in the early 1980s, that digital data was more easily transmitted. And so the Canadian Astronomy Data Center was formed in 1986 as one of the three archive sites for data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's grown over the years where it now hosts over a petabyte of data from various telescopes around the world. They've moved into cloud computing uh, and, and over 60% of the world's astronomers now use data or systems provided by the Canadian Astronomy Data Center. Wow, yeah. that's tremendous. It's data is the exploding now in astronomy and there's even larger and larger uh, volumes of data and uh, the world's gonna people are gonna have a hard time dealing with it mm. <laughs> new challenges yes yeah new, new frontiers challenges. yes now a century of research of um, discoveries uh, through the Plaskett telescope and the other telescopes what are some of the highlights for you as an astronomer Dennis that you've seen um, well I think you know the work that uh, John Stanley Plaskett did was Richard's father uh, on determining the rotation and size of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is probably the most outstanding work done by the 1.8 meter telescope we have in Victoria. It really was the first time we had a really reliable, accurate measurement on the size of the galaxy, the amount, number of stars in the galaxy, how fast the sun moved around the center. So it was just outstanding work that was done uh, in the early 1930s. We had at our breakfast table visiting astronomers on this very topic that Dennis talked about to where my father would be explaining to Otto Struve or other astronomers the work that Plaskett and my father had done because this was indeed the first scientific proof for the rotation of the galaxy and for the time that it took for our sun to go around the center of of the galaxy to have it turn. And it, my father used salt and pepper shakers in co coffee cups to demonstrate this ro yes, yeah. rotation of the galaxy. So I sort of got this at the breakfast table and then we saw it in print. So th that was a very intimate experience to see the years of work that he and Plaskett did come to fruition. 
That's tremendous. As you're sitting there pouring the milk on your cereal, mm. they're discussing yes. this with you the as latest, a young... The absolute th latest, most astounding work done in science. Cutting yeah. edge, frontier work that has never been done before. That's what a tremendous slice of uh, history that is, that you were right there on the forefront. Well, it took so many, many hours of spectroscopic analysis for that. And recently mm. with Dennis at the observatory, <clears throat> Much of this is done automatically now, and the astronomer doesn't yeah. have to do that kind of prolonged yeah. observation and measurement. Right. My dad worked on projects that took two or three years to come to yeah. completion. Awesome. That was yeah. a long project. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so, Dennis, so if people want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, <laughs> if people want to visit the observatory this yes. summer, tell us uh, a little bit a about the opportunities. Uh, on Saturday nights, we have summer star parties uh, every Saturday night, mm -hmm. and people can get tickets for them. They're free, but we need do need tickets because we have limited parking on the hill. And what's that website they can get the, the tickets They can at? go to the center of the universe dot net, <laughs> and that's with an R E, the center of the universe dot net. And this year, because it's the centennial, uh, for the months of July and August, the center of the universe, our visitor center, is open Tuesday to Friday, 10 to 3. Uh, it's open to the public. It's absolutely free. And we have a, an exhibit that the Royal British Columbia Museum made on our centennial. And that's going to be in the center of the universe for the, those two months as well. Wonderful. And uh, the Governor General, I believe, was a part of the the Yes, um, we had a ceremony. plaque unveiling for designating our site as a National Historic Site. Mm -hmm. uh, the Governor General couldn't make it. We invited her and she was very sorry, but she couldn't make it. But she felt strongly enough about her connection with the observatory that she sent a personal message by video that was played to the gathering uh, people at the, at the unveiling. Very powerful message from the Governor General. Everybody was most pleased to hear it. And how appropriate is that? Because obviously our Governor General, Julie Payette, is an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And for her to have that honor and for the observatory to have someone of her caliber was just a really oh, beautiful yeah. it was, everybody, experience. Everybody was just over the moon, to yeah. quote, point of phrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for um, coming today, and Richard for sharing your childhood memories. Dennis, good luck. Uh, briefly, what's the next 100 years hold for the observatory? I'm working on right now is virtual reality. I'm bringing all our work on our instruments and everything into the virtual reality world, and hopefully sometime next year people can download it and explore the insides of our instruments and how they work. Oh, now that's... Mm -hmm. I'll Tremendous. come back next year and tell yeah, you about we'll it. There you go. We'll have another, our annual visit. Yes, our yeah, annual visit. thank you. Thanks for walking us through the stars and the universe mm -hmm. and the cosmos today, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. All the best of luck to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for watching Coast Connections, and we look forward to having you uh, join us again. And meanwhile, keep your feet planted on the earth, but keep looking at the stars. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again.